So in Ephesians chapter 5, 7 to 10, Ephesians 5, 7 to 10 continues the train of thought of not acting like they were formerly as unbelievers, believers in this church age, who practice such sinful things continually, but to act in accordance with their newfound position in Christ and their destiny of eternal life in the eternal kingdom of Christ and God. Therefore, do not be partakers with them, sons of disobedience, unbelievers, for you were once darkness, Paul advised us, you, you, me, but now you are light in the Lord. So, in our position, we're light in the Lord, but in our behavior, not. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. So that's a review of that. Now, we're moving on to Ephesians 5, 11 to 13, which reads, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful. We're not supposed to have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them, unfruitful works of darkness. I guess a separate word here. For it is disgraceful, disgraceful, even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret, sons of disobedience, or us as wayward unbelievers, unfaithful believers. We're not way, way, wayward believers, unfaithful believers, which are done by them in secret, or us in our unfaithfulness, but all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light of Christ. So if we're doing something, um, God's going to make it manifest to the light, regardless of how we think we disguise it or hide it. For whatever makes manifest is light. And God is going to make it. Jesus Christ, the light of Christ, will expose our problems. As a matter of fact, 1 John 1, what is it? I have to, let me in. Uh, go to the library. I want to get New American Standard Standard Bible out of this. There it is. 1995. New American Standard Bible. 1 John. 1 7. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we walk in the light, we're exp he, the light of Christ is exposing our faults, our sin. And because of our acknowledgement, we're purposely walking in the light of Christ to show up our failings, our unfaithfulness, our acts of sin. And that brings us, as we acknowledge it, into fellowship with one another, the Son of God with us. So, we have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose those works, not, but not in the sense of not associating with unbelievers or unfaithful believers, but believers, nevertheless, are not to support, advocate, or identify themselves with such works of darkness that unbelievers or unfaithful believers do. Instead, believers are to expose the evil deeds and speak against them, even perform works of light that show up, expose the works of darkness by comparison, and for what those works are. The believer is, not, is to not adopt the standard of of or fall into the ways of darkness or sinful behavior. This is a tough order. Stay walking in the light of Christ and not lament over our temporal life and circumstances. We could uh, have fellowship with people that aren't Christian because they're having fun. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by unbelievers in secret. But all evil things that are exposed are made manifest by the light in the sense of made manifest as evil when compared with godly truth. Whatever manifests evil, it is the, the light of godliness that comes from God. 
at times expressed through believers. This is best accomplished by the believer by letting the light of Christ shine through himself by a godly thought, word, and deed. I need to work on that. Has learned from Scripture. I got my nose in Scripture a lot, but I've got to take it to heart. It is better not to dwell on the evil character of works of darkness, but that would bring too much attention upon evil and less upon godly good. Whereupon in Ephesians 5.14, which reads, now we're really toward the end of this passage, which is a great one, for having fellowship and conducting the Christ, ourselves in the Christian life. For this reason, it says, Awake, sleeper. Awake, you sleeper who's a believer. And arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Author and Apostle Paul refers to several passages from the Hebrew Bible, or from an early hymn referring to a believer who was temporally dead in his sins, inactive in his faithfulness, and is commanded to wake up and to lead a godly life so that Christ will shine on him. This first verse contain, contains a quotation from a combination of Old Testament passages, <clears throat> similar contexts, or perhaps from an early, early Christian hymn. In any case, the words speak of a believer who has committed deeds of darkness, who is commanded to wake up and rise from the dead, as he is involved with the deeds of evildoers. Here is a Christian who has no deeds, divine good works. His faith, his very life, is considered dead, inactive by Scripture, and the God who inspired that Scripture. This Christian is not physically dead, nor spiritually dead. He is temporally dead, dead meaning useless, in the same way, inactive, in the same way that faith without works is dead, useless to God, James 2, 17 and 26. He is out of fellowship with God. He walks in darkness, having grieved God the Holy Spirit with his sin. Ephesians 4, 30. His soul is separated from the righteousness of God, and he is useless to God until that sin is dealt with. 1 John 5. 1 John 5 through 10. 1 John 1, 5 through 10. Take a look at this. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with, with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now we say, if we say that we have no sin, believers, I have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Here's the remedy. If we confess our sins, the ones we're aware of, He, God, is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And verse 10 is kind of similar to 8. If we say, we believers say that we have not sinned. Some, some say, well, for a while there I haven't sinned. We make God, Him, a liar. And his word is not in us. While he is in the state of temporal death, under the control of his sin nature, he produces nothing of eternal value. Romans 8.8 8. Romans 8.6a 6, says that the mind of sinful man is death. The man described in Ephesians 5.14 is a believer, but he's a sinful believer, a believer who is not under the control of the spirit but under the control of the sin nature. Compare Galatians 5, 13 to 15. You, my brothers, were called to be free. 
but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. Notice some topics I'm going, going on and studying in 1 Corinthians. We have a freedom in Christ. But, for example, eating meat sacrificed to idols. Those days, he didn't do that for, for concern over your weaker brother. And the entire law is summed up in a single command. Love yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. So if you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Now we have an expositor's Bible commentary on Ephesians 5, 13 to 14. I'm trying to get my head up there in the picture. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. For this reason, it is. it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Now, expositors said, Paul appeals to the effect of light in the natural world. It penetrates wherever it shines, so that everything is lit up by it. In the same way, whenever the light of Christ appears, I get this balance here. Uh, Sorry about this. Okay, let me get my knee up. Okay, that's better. So, in the same way, whenever the light of Christ appears, it shows up sin for what it is. Evil can no longer masquerade as anything else. Paul let the light fall on the ungodliness of the pagan world and exposed it for what it really was. Romans 1, 18-32. For, Paul adds, he adds, it is the function of light to make visible. Whatever hidden wickedness is revealed by the light of Christ can no longer be obscured by darkness, but is, it is shown up in its real nature. So if we walk in the light of Christ, we purposely examine ourselves in the light of Christ, the word of God, which he inspired to be written we'll see the evil nature that we have expressed. Ephesians 5.14 For this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. The same introductory formula as in Ephesians 4.8 prefaces a quotation. The lines form a metrical triplet in a rhythm that was specifically specially associated with religious initiation chants. It could have been an old hymn. This may well supply a clue in tracing their origin. <clears throat> they are not a direct quotation of Old Testament scripture, though they contain echoes of Isaiah 60 and 1, and possibly other passages in the same prophecy. Isaiah 9-2, 46-19, 51-17, 52-1. Isaiah 60 and 1. Arise, shine, for your light, the light of Christ has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear upon you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Very similar theme. Compare Isaiah 61. Okay, I just read that. So, nor can they be found in any, these, these words, any apocryphal book. It is unlikely that Paul's memory was at fault, as some have surmised, and that he imagined he was citing scripture, when in fact he was using some unidentified source. It has also been suggested that the poem was Paul's own composition as he enlarged on scriptural things, or that he was reproducing the content of prophecy in the light of its fulfillment. Others again speculate as to whether the lines are to be attributed to Jesus himself. The most likely solution seems to be that this is an early baptismal hymn based on Isaiah 60 and 1. Paul is soon to mention hymns 
in the context of worship, 